smallest entry is, uh, the smallest exponent is 36, which is a triangular number. The largest exponent in this case is 100, which is a pentagonal number. So given that hint, one can easily rewrite these things as this. And as a result of that, you can, using the formula that you see on the board there, what you can wind up with is, this is the theorem like this, and this is the entree uh, that allows the people working in the, uh, the weak mass forms to understand the algebraic and analytic behavior of the fifth order mock data functions because there are a variety of formulas like this. This is, resembles formulas that Hecke found, so many times one calls this the Hecke representation, but these sorts of formulas actually go back to Rogers. Ramanujan seems not to have written down any like this. Whether he knew them or not, we don't know, but these are not, this is not the sort of formula that he would have written down. So, if one, uh, one introduces a second parameter in this, namely an a to the n here, an a to the n here, and an a there, then there are still relations between alphas and betas. And indeed, the alphas can be computed from the betas by the formula that you see in green. And if you rewrite this formula in standard form, what you will get is a number of finite factors out in front of the sum, and then a sum that is like this. And so these are all the sums that you would get in studying the relationship between this series and this other series. Almost always this series <coughs> will be the, uh, the sum side of, of the theorem, and this will contain the information related to modular forms or the mass forms or other uh, structures of that nature. Well, the important point to be made here is that all the classical Q orthogonal polynomials are of this form. All the classical Q orthogonal polynomials are of this form, and all of necessity from the theory of orthogonal polynomials all have appealing 312. The theory doesn't guarantee an appealing 312. <laughs> <laughs> that, that turns out in practice. They all have appealing three term recurrence relations so that uh, the thing to stress here is classically what one has been looking at is instances of this series in black where the betas satisfy a two-term recurrence relation. In other words, the betas are some sort of finite product. But, so what's the next thing up? The next thing up is a three-term recurrence relation. And so, basically, there are a variety of, of such polynomials. So, let me remind you of some of them. There are obviously what are called the big Q Jacobi polynomials. That's all big because they're also little Q Jacobi polynomials. And uh, so they are in some sense, in terms of a hyper, Q hypergeometric function sense, these are the uh, these are the fully general terminating uh, three phi twos. And uh, they have this, this formulation. Uh, there is, of course, beyond this, uh, the ASCII-Wilson polynomials, which are now uh, four phi threes, and indeed what are called balanced four phi threes, the Q times the product of the top entries equals the product of the bottom entries. And uh, the, uh, in, in their <coughs> seminal paper on this, they tell you precisely what the, uh, the full three-term recurrence is for this, uh, for this balance to 4B3. So, there, so you have everything, so to speak, spelled out for you in the literature. Okay, so that is the way that uh, I 
got back into thinking about orthogonal polynomials because uh, the, the, the relationship between the Rogers Ramanujan identities and that F0 of Q fifth order mod theta function uh, it is precisely the, uh, the sort of thing that, uh, that led me to the observation that what was going on in this relationship was the role of these, these orthogonal polynomials. So I started off with an example of the, uh, the application of false theta functions, but I want to go on and put together a mix of the, the types of developments I've just described for you and the role of, of what one learns about the uh, about uh, various possibilities for application utilizing the fact that, so to speak, the next step along beyond these two-term occurrences for these betas are the three-term occurrences. So what I'm going to talk about is <clears throat> what I would call concave <coughs> composition. So in the theory of partitions, one does not take order of the summands into account so that um, that 3 plus 1 and 1 plus 3 are considered the same partition of 4. But uh, following the, the definitions created by P.A. McMahon, a composition is a partition where you do take order into account. So 3 plus 1 and 1 plus 3 are different compositions of 4, but they are the same partition. So once you get into the world of ordering uh, the summands of a partition, the world of compositions, you can obviously uh, throw some restrictions in and throw out others so that the, the what I would call concave compositions are fundamentally uh, uh, partitions sort of glued together uh, right in the middle where you have strict de decrease into the middle then you have two, part, two summands that are identical, and then you have strict increase out to the end. And uh, these I will call concave compositions of even length for obvious reasons. Namely, in the example, there are both an equal number of A's and B's. And in this particular case, I want all the entries to be uh, non-negative. So, since I showed you this previous generating function, uh, the, the argument here for what the generating function for these concave compositions of even length, CCELs, I seem to be given to horrid acronyms today, you don't have to forget <laughs> that. Uh, uh, so here is the, here's the, uh, the generating function uh, that, for all such uh, concave compositions. And just as I did before, uh, two of these things, uh, the A's up to AM and the B's up to E sub M, <laughs> sum up perfectly with the requirement, obviously, that the first A's all are larger than A sub M plus one, and the M other B's are all larger than B sub M plus one, so that that requirement leads by summing up according to the standard way one generates partitions. We're left with this, and of course, since am plus one is equal to bm plus one, this is the generating function for these CCELs. So it's very much like the one you saw before, except now we have this extra factor down in the denominator. So, Here is the theorem. These CCDLs have a generating function, a quotient of the false theta pentagonal number series divided by Euler's pentagonal number series. And so it is immediately obvious that all the coefficients have to be even because all you need to do to turn the numerator into the denominator 
is to change a few signs from plus to minus and minus to plus, which of course does nothing modulo 2. And so modulo 2, this quotient is equal to 1. And that means